And today's broadcast is brought to you by Eclectic Horseman Magazine. Stay tuned for Eclectic Conversations, hosted by Emily Kitchen. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. I'm here with Barney Nelson to talk about her very exciting new book, 100 Horses. And it's a it's a departure from what you've done in the past, but it also feels very familiar. So tell us a little bit about what what this book is all about. Uh, that's a good question. It's um, it's a um, combination of movie scripts and memoir. So I call it um, the title is 100 Horses with the subtitle of drama as novel, memoir as drama. And I kind of named it that way because I it's fiction, which I don't usually write. Um, but it's really based on my journalism uh, career and my life, the memoir. So um, I kind of try to defend it in the introduction as a as a new kind of novel. It just didn't seem to fit any of the pigeonholes that are out there. So I tried to invent a new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, tell tell us a little bit about like what, how did you, how did you come to feel like that was something that you wanted to share uh, with the world? Well, um, I like to let my characters, because of being a journalist, speak in their own voices, sort of. So as I was trying to invent characters as a, um, as a piece of fiction, I tried to use as many words that I had heard in interviews or heard in life or something like that as my as my dialogue and I um I've always been a fan of drama I'm kind of a Shakespeare scholar and so I wanted to combine just just dialogue pure dialogue and let people speak for themselves with um with a story and so the to me it builds into a novel um it's really five different or four different screenplays and then one stage drama and then one monologue um but to me it builds into a novel because of the, the way the characters progress through each um through each chapter mm -hmm. one and of the Go ahead. Um, I'm just going to say that I also feel like a lot of the movies and TV shows don't ever portray the cowboy culture or the horse culture as authentically as what I wish they did. So I thought I'd try my hand at it since that's what my specialty has been my whole life. Yeah. That, and that was, that was right. What, where I was going with, with my next question like that, that's a statement that you make in the introduction about that dissatisfaction. And tell me, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Like what, what parts do you feel like they're missing? I mean, I, I, this is sort of a leading question, but tell, tell us a little bit what, what, what they're missing. Um, I feel like they, they don't really see the cowboy culture, the horse culture as as real people, they're either imagining them as some kind of a villain that's, you know, um, a rebel without a cause, <laughs> or as some kind of a heroic person that lives in a utopia. Um, and they never really quite capture the real, the real people. And um, so like, for instance, the TV show Yellowstone, I don't know whether we'll get sued for talking about them or not, but um, they get a lot of, they get a lot of things right. They get, um, the costuming is great. Um, some of the language is okay, except for all the curse words. I mean, I've never in my life heard that many curse words. And I mean, I've been around cowboys my whole life. And a lot of times when they did not know I was there. So it's not just because they knew there was a lady present. 
and they just don't nobody talks like that and i have known ranchers all over the world and i've never known one of one single one of them that ever committed a murder <laughs> so you know, it's it's over the top and i guess hollywood thinks they need that for to be interesting mm -hmm. and maybe they do so maybe they'll find my book very boring but i tried to make it more real and concentrate more on the subtleties of because one of the things that it seems like cowboy friends and me personally um we all struggle with relationships and the horse and rider has always traditionally in literature been sort of a metaphor or symbol or whatever for um that horse and rider or that relationship and love kind of situation mm -hmm. and so i i um kind of tried to make the people symbolic of the kind of relationship you can establish with horses and then the relationships with horses kind of symbolic of the people so i don't know how successful that was but that was my goal mm -hmm. maybe you could just um like briefly introduce sort of the each of the plays you do an incredible job and i think i mean in re in reading the book the novel like like you said there's so many components to it the the screenplays are incredibly rich and and have so much uh craft to them but the introductions i kept finding myself just really marveling at how you how you and sharing your experience you lay this incredible framework that just puts what's about to come in in perspective and in place like you just do an, an amazing job preparing the reader for what they're about to experience in the screenplay and i i just i'm i this isn't really a question this is i'm just sort of like saying how much i enjoyed that because i think that context um adds to the richness so much where if you just picked it up and read it i uh, it, we're we're so busy we're so distracted we're not always like in the right frame of mind so it's sort of like putting the reader in the round pen getting them hooked on and and ready to do something and then they can they can really enjoy it for what it is so um i just my hat's off to you for for coming up with that way of showcasing what you have to offer well thanks um and that was exactly what i was trying to do um part of my goal with it is i'm hoping it appeals to um teachers uh in especially rural areas because to me when i was teaching um i was a college professor for many years at sol ross state university and whenever i'd be searching for textbooks or things to teach students it just seemed like most of what was available and what was out there was aimed at kids in urban areas or teachers in urban areas. And so I had a unique set of students, you know, that were on the border and usually called at risk kind of students because they were often bilingual and uh, did not come usually from wealthy families and so I wanted to find ways of introducing literature to them in a way that they could see what what that writer was trying to do. So that's kind of what I try to do here is, is set it up like a teacher would for reading a play um, in class or a poem or anything else. And try to fill in the gaps of what they might not be familiar with because some of what I write about is going to be unusual even to kids in rural areas because uh, like for instance the first chapter is um a big outfit with you know a chuck wagon and I lived that life but not many people have so I added details from that life and through my life and experiences and kind of introduced them to the characters as where the line comes in between the real person and the fiction person. And then I also used 
my photography to illustrate that world so that they would have a little bit of a picture. I think movies in some ways take away from our imagination. We, we watch a movie and we're sort of stuck with whatever it is they've given us as what the visual would be. But when you read a book yourself or you read a play yourself, you can imagine whatever you want to in you know the characters or the setting or um so I, I try to give them enough visual and descriptive to help them get into it a little bit but then leave room for them to use their own imaginations and and apply it maybe to themselves or to the world they they know mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? <laughs> you did. You did. And that was, and I'm like, my brain is going in several different directions from there. One of which is that was one of the most favorite things when Sydney was little is we would always read a book first and, and then watch the movie and compare and contrast and have some really fun conversations about, you know, the choices that they made as far as that. Um, but my other line of thinking, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to ask this without, like you are speaking a truth that you experience and observe because as a journalist, you are, that is your job is to share reality. And so then you're, you're sort of, you're taking that into this creative realm. And, but then all, by the end of the book, you're bringing it back to you in, in the monologue. So you're sort of playing with these tensions throughout the whole thing of, what is real and what is authentic and what is creative. I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to ask that, but like, like you're writing about, you know, uh, the Hispanic, the couple that are uh, on the border, you know, and the border patrol and, and all of those dynamics. And, and it's so beautiful and so rich. And in this sort of modern context, like, is that okay? It, are people like, and do you care if that's okay? And you're, but you're sharing a real thing. So uh, this yeah. might just be between you and me. <laughs> 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 so. I do very much care about that, but I feel like um, if there's ever been a culture that's been culturally appropriated by outsiders telling their story, it's the horse and cowboy culture. I mean, you know, they've been that's been going on with them for since the very first, some of the very first silent movies, you know, were about cowboys with six guns in their hands, robbing banks and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I do question that and try to push the boundaries of that and try to keep the boundaries intact where they need to be, I think, and maybe cross them where I think I can. Uh, for instance, the this the chapter that's set on um, kind of the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. I I did stories on the Northern Cheyenne and, and um, Crow reservations for Western Horsemen, and I went and interviewed the ranchers there and people that were raising horses and and. Indians who considered themselves cowboys in, instead of whatever tribe that they were um, affiliated with. And so I feel like with my background, I'm more, um, I don't know, this, sound, this is going to probably sound a little bit arrogant, but I feel like I'm more tuned in to that part of their life than people who belong to the same tribe and because most again most of them most of the writers come from urban situations you know they're not really the people that are raising cattle on the reservations they're not the ones that are um, starting horses on the reservations so I think that I can cross some of those boundaries uh, even in South America you know I, w I went to Paraguay and I watched and photographed I, I didn't speak the language well enough to interview very many people, but the Guarani Indians there, um, 
you know, I kind of just knew how to be around them and they knew how to be around me and they could tell by what I was taking pictures of that I kind of understood, you know, or appreciated what, what their lives were like. Um, so I, I think it goes, I think culture goes way deeper than race. And I guess that maybe that's another thing I'm trying to get across in the book is that this is a culture based around horses, you know, and race, religion, even economic status, you know, nothing else really matters because you can, you're, you're inside, you're a lot of the same people and you're a lot of, you have a lot of the same values and all that no matter um, what your ethnicity or other characteristics might be, you know, that you have that touchstone as a culture. And I think that happens with other cultures. Like I think soldiers tend to do that. You know, they, they understand one another more than maybe they do the people that they are supposed to be part of. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and it forms it forms new boundaries and a new group a new friendship new um understanding yeah and i think it crosses genders and it you know all anything so um i'm kind of interested in getting rid of instead of enhancing all these boundaries between us through the cowboy story because it seems to fascinate people and it seems to be um be something that enough people understand at some at different levels mm -hmm. that it can do that and i and <laughs> This again sounds kind of arrogant because I'm not trying to compare myself to Shakespeare, but I think he did a lot of that with horses. And in my research and in one of the chapters that I have in the book, I try to argue for that. You know that he was um, he was crossing a lot of borders with his plays that were in place in his day because of how much he knew about horses or horse training that could be applied to people. Mm -hmm. talk, talk a little bit more because I, I mean, I, I'm a big Shakespeare fan and I know we talked about uh, printing an excerpt in the magazine and, you know, like maybe not everybody loves Shakespeare, but tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your relationship with Shakespeare. How did you, how did you come to, to care about what he had to say. Um, well, again, this is another boundary that I'm kind of trying to cross in the book between, you know, the quote, quote, uneducated rural redneck and academics, you know, because <laughs> I think Shakespeare was one of us, not one of them. And um, so I kind of try to prove that my um the way i'm connected is when i did my master's thesis in english when i was studying to become an academic i used my background as a cowboy and cowboy journalist um and so i did my research on shakespeare's use of horsemanship to in, to develop character in his plays and when i was finished with my thesis and had analyzed all these different Shakespearean characters in that way my professor said that I had forever ruined Shakespeare for them because now all they could see was horses <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so things like um, a horse a horse my kingdom for a horse you know there's just so many lines in his work that are directly related to horses but then there's so many subtle things like the taming of the shrew is the one that i i use in the book and um, it's a really misunderstood play a lot of people think it's abusive and um but they think a lot of horse training is abusive too and so i kind of try i'm trying to help people see beyond the stereotypes and whether it's 
academic gender, <laughs> animal versus human, um, all that sort of stuff is what I've tried to tackle. So one of the other themes that I wanted to visit with you a little bit about was um, in the war on sugar, in the introduction, you talk about the idea of stolen valor. And I, and that really, uh, I thought it's, it's really brought up a lot of interesting things. And also in sort of talking about the, thinking about the cowboy culture in, in like, you know, I'm not a cowboy, but I, I wear leggings and I put on, you know, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm playing dress up in some ways with the trappings of this, of this very functional gear to go, you know, ride my horse around the pasture. I'm not working on a big ranch. I'm not doing a big job. Um, so there, but there's, and I know in my work, with the magazine, I mean, there is a part of that that is that it resonates with us to want to be a part of that world. Um, but where where are we? Where are we? Where I, I'm not really sure. Again, I'm not asking questions. I'm just sort of wanting to visit with you about this idea because as I'm reading it, I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, like how do you? how do you acknowledge and honor something that you have respect for without crossing that line to, to the stolen valor idea? Uh, yeah, I tried to use the character that um, the salesman villain sort of character in that, in that um, chapter as a, representative of the difference between you know we're all I mean even though I've done it most of my life and and did work on a lot of big ranches I was never a top hand or anything like that you know but I tried to dress like one <laughs> so that I could you know get to go along and uh, so we're all in a sense you know sort of playing a role, I guess you might call it. And even my character in that, that's a Marine, you know, he understands that courage is complicated and being a soldier is complicated and being a cowboy is complicated, you know, and none of us ever feel like we're good enough. Um, but the guy that bothers me with it is when he does it for the sake of fooling somebody, you know, to where he is um, wearing camouflage clothes so that people will think he is a, um, a veteran and think he has served it. and he knows what he's doing and he knows that he's doing it so that he can get his farmers um, to think he's a better guy than what maybe he really is or the outdoorsman cap that he wears, you know, that he's trying to, he's trying to assume the, the, the good stereotypes from those cultures because he knows it will work on the customers he's trying to sell stuff to. And so, um, you know, Nike does it with athletics and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and there's a good side to it. It's not uh, totally all bad. I mean, you know, when you are a kid and you admire famous athletes or something and you want to wear the same clothes that they do, hopefully you're also wanting to take on some of the habits that they have, you know, like to practice and work hard and, and hopefully not the bad ones. But even cowboys, we have some bad ones, you know, we're not by any means saints. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I try, uh, maybe I probably, um, because I love that life and the people, um, I probably make them a little bit more heroic than I should. Uh, but 
um, I just think there's so many things that people need today that we're not finding anywhere. And so um, I hoped that the book would give them a little bit of hope and a place to start looking yeah. in a way a way to look that's a good way you know because you're I'm sure as as a person who rides a horse you're always striving to get better and you're always paying attention and you're trying not to hurt your horse or anyone else and um, so your attitude is is in the right place yeah and I think most of us are like that or at least I hope so that's my my view of human nature and I hope I don't get to wake up someday and realize I was naive and we're all <laughs> real bad people <laughs> yeah no well and that's I mean like um, so many of the characters in the work like they they're human they're utterly human but they're the the trend is up like there's the the aspirational part that makes you makes the reader think I mean you do an amazing job at making the reader think which I feel like is a huge you know a monumental task to to get people to look at their own lives and look at their own I mean question th things that you assume um you you do a great job in sort of challenging challenging and and having that but but not in a negative way thank you I that was a goal and I hope I come close to achieving it. I think we need it and too much of what we see in movies or read in today's news or uh, maybe even learn in school is negative and it doesn't give us answers you know it's we're great at finding all the problems and pointing out all the errors of our former presidents and former heroes you know we're always looking for their clay feet but we're not so good at remembering the good parts of them that we should you know that we we could still benefit from so I guess it's sifting the good stuff from the not so good stuff. And it's like horses, you know, you ignore the parts of them that are not quite there yet and make them feel good about the parts of their lives that are that, where they're doing good. Maybe just tell us a little bit about each of the screenplays in the novel. Okay. Um, the first one is. Um, kind of set on a big ranch with a chuck wagon um, like the 06 where I lived for 13 years. And some of the characters in there are based on people that I knew. And um, and then what I'm my goal with that one is, is to try to tell the um, cowboy version of immigration, I guess, because here living on the border, you know, some people with it that are of Hispanic descent are native Texans and they've always been because the flags over Texas changed. You know, they didn't move here. <laughs> Even their ancestors didn't move here from Mexico. They lived here, you know, ever since. Usually anybody with um, brown hair and brown eyes that is from this part of the country, they're usually part Native American. And so, um, you know, it's a mixture of the European early conquistadors and whatever, and the native people. So some of them are not immigrants at all. And some of them are speak fluent Spanish. Some of them don't speak any Spanish because they grew up here and their parents did and their grandparents did. And so I tried to touch on every different kind of situation I could, whether they were really poor or whether they were educated or whether they came from very wealthy Mexico ranching families, um, Charos, and um, so I tried to mix all of those kind different kinds of situations into the story. But the basic story tells us tells about one um, 
immigrant or illegal immigrant who came to help the cook and the border patrol picked him up and took him away and he came back within just 24 hours and um, the boss was so impressed with that heroic effort because his feet were swelled up like dinner plates and all this was based on things that had happened here and um, that I had witnessed and um, anyway the boss was so impressed with that that he offered to help him get a green card and maybe even citizenship and so the that chapter um, follows him through his pursuit of citizenship and then he also falls in love with one of the the daughters of one of the cowboys um, who's also a cowgirl on the crew and they both have some struggles to get past before they end up happily ever after at the end um in in the next one about that set on the indian reservations um it's kind of the i guess my purpose with it is to try to investigate all the different ways that people keep themselves from getting involved with drugs and alcohol that i've witnessed um and it seems like if they have a purpose that's the biggest key um and or if they choose a everything's addictive you know writing is addictive <laughs> and um drinking coffee is addictive so but you can choose addictions that can improve your life rather than choosing addictions that destroy your life so that was kind of um what that one is about but it's it's also centered around a couple of love stories this time um one between a rancher and a banker and these are all native american characters and then one is a traditionalist and a casino boss um the, the casino boss is a female and the banker is a female and so woven into their love story is kind of the goal of trying to help the kids on the reservation stay away from drugs and alcohol and um and i guess the overall theme of that one is that we need each other and we need to find a purpose and so if we work together maybe we can solve some of these problems um the one with the um marine and the stolen valor um is a love story again between a california juice bar owner that's a female and the um and a marine cowboy that owns a ranch and it turns out that she's actually a farmer that is raising her own fruit for the juices and so that one kind of um i call it the war on sugar because it's sort of a i don't know kind of making fun of the hallmark movies i guess that are trying to entice us all to you know think that christmas is all about hot chocolate and over the top decorations and cookies and it's just sugar, 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 sugar. And because I've struggled with my weight all my life and face diseases now that are connected to that, um, I think it's a good thing to try to fight against. And so it became a way to look at war and soldiers and what we fight for and what we don't fight for. Um, through again a love story but a lot of other things woven into it and then um the chapter called a brand for two is a female horseshoer that's kind of a feminist and a um chauvinistic old-fashioned cowboy that they both have work injuries um her wrist is giving her trouble because of hammering all the time and his back is giving giving him trouble from shoeing horses all the time. So his wrist is okay and her back is okay. So they kind of pair up shoe horses. And um, so it's kind of a, 
I guess the theme of that one is partnership and how a partnership actually develops and what what you need from one another, I guess. Then the Shakespeare chapter is, um, I call it Taming Binion's Daughter. And I don't know how many of your viewers will know who Benny Binion is. I changed the spelling of the name to a, a Hispanic name with a Enya over the N instead of the way Binion actually spelled his name. But it uses, um, he was famous for the horses that he raised for rodeo, bucking horses and bucking bulls. And then also, he was famous among ranch cowboys for the horses that he raised that they liked. They were not easy horses. And, um, but once you got their trust, then they were the best. I mean, the, you know, the cowboys all just really liked those horses. And Binion was the guy that brought rodeo to Las Vegas. So it's sort of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew set in Las Vegas, and it's kind of um, rodeo meets Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right on, you know, that it's uh, the, the guy that finally tames the wild daughter of Binion uh, is a Nevada cowboy who has confidence that his horsemanship can help her see that who she really is, not, she doesn't really tame her and doesn't Shakespeare's version either. So it's, it's very much based on horsemanship skills. And the very last one is just a one lone female character dressed in her cowboy regalia, sitting on an empty stage and discussing maybe some of the misunderstandings that people have about um, cowgirls or female cowboys and um, and hoping that with the emphasis on gender today that it won't end up taking horses away from little girls again. And um, so the way that I see the book developing is kind of um, an evolution especially of the female characters. I mean, they don't, they're, they seem to be playing a second role, you know, like the, in the first one, um, she sort of needs him in order to lead, lead the life that she wants to lead. She needs to marry a cowboy. Um, and in the one on the um, reservations, they all sort of need each other in order to solve something. And in, the one on um, the war on sugar uh, is kind of it, uh, discusses freedom, I guess, and how what what freedom really means. And then um, the horseshoers. How do you get past a in a partnership? How do you get past the biases and stereotypes that you both come to it with. Um, and then in Taming, it's kind of a, uh, the females kind of go from maybe needing a man to where in Taming, she doesn't need one. She hates men. She hates everything associated with men. Um, but that's not really... <laughs> what's gonna make her happy. And um, and then in the end, it's kind of just a female by herself. So it's, I don't know, evolution of the female character, but it's also an evolution of the male character. And, and then it seems like we start over, you know, we, yeah. we can't seem to ever solve it. We go back to zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it repeats itself, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, well, and they're such, I mean, like they're like in just your synopsis of each one, like they're, these are not small, uh, trivial things. <laughs> these are big, you know, top shelf issues that you're exploring, um, that are, that are super relevant and, uh, and really interesting to think about. 
Well, I hope so. Um, they're all romances, but they're not, you know, if you read them, they're not really about romance. <laughs> I mean, yes, they're, they are, but there's, there's so much more even to romance, you know, that it's, um, it involves all these deeper things, you know, like defending yourself or uh, getting along with pe other people or um, being a provider, being a um, fear in fear of love or um, the difference between reality and illusion and um, they're all tangled up with that because that's what makes love, marriage, and all of our relationships so complicated. And so I've kind of tried to just um, put a lot of, put as much of it as I could into one book that goes through a lot of those different complications. And I'm not sure I come up with any answers, but I try to at least bring up lots of different ways of looking at the questions. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's just, I mean, I think that's why it's so authentic is it's not, it's not a point A to point B. It's, um, it's so nuanced and so, uh, it's so real, like all, all the characters, you know, because they came from your life and because they are speaking in authentic language, you know, they, they, they live on the page in a way that is, is very special. Well, thanks. I hope so that was my goal yeah. yeah yeah so what um what would your what what would you put put your wish for this book out into the universe what what do you hope for this book um I hope that small town teachers discover it you know and maybe because I think it explains a lot of things that students are not or kids uh teenagers or young adults are not finding anywhere else. Um, and I, I'd like to see it discovered by some of the people making movies. Um, I'm not looking for a career. I'm too old for that. I'm not looking for getting rich because I'm comfortable. I don't need that. Um, not looking for fame because I'm an old recluse and I really, you know, it kills me to do these interviews. <laughs> I do. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't want to do, you should be, you should be, yeah, this is the only interview I, that I remember. I don't think anybody said, I've let anybody else ever interview me. I mean, so you should feel <laughs> quite um, honored, but you do, do, you have a very sincere way of asking questions and a, and a very um you've done your homework before you go into a interview and so it doesn't seem like the phoniness of most interviews you know and the gotcha questions or any of that kind of stuff so your uh, kudos to you and then I've already forgotten what your question is. <laughs> well, I just, if I mean, I, I, um, so small town teachers and, and maybe a movie and, and, um, I mean, I, I, I just, yeah, I just want, want you to have the chance to sort of, you know, put it, put it out there, what your, what you would love for this book is it takes its legs and walks away from you, you know, what, where would you like it to go? Um, well, I just have known lots of cowboys who struggled with relationships, you know, lots of old bachelors, lots of divorces. And um, so I would like to see people read it that maybe it can give them a little bit of insight or, I mean, I'm divorced too, so I'm not, I don't consider myself an expert on rom romance, but I've studied this kind of stuff so much and I have so much belief in some of the things that 
horsemanship can help you with, you know, so maybe it's not going to answer all the questions, but maybe it can help a little bit. And it's back to Hollywood, you know, I think, um, I think one of the ways to reach huge audiences is through movies. And that's, of course, I think any writer's goal is to help, uh, not help, that assumes everybody's a weakling. <laughs> to um, let people know that they're not the only ones struggling with this. They're not the only ones that have um, problems like this and that there's all kinds of different ways to approach it or, and, it, and it's almost like, um, like a horse, you know, you start where they are and then you try to um, fit what you're hoping for into what they might be hoping for and so that you can form a port a partnership of some kind that is fulfilling for both and um so that i guess is part of it and movies can help reach big audiences but all of the trappings that go with that is not what i'm interested in you know it's just that they have a very loud voice yeah yeah <laughs> that, uh, that can help. And I think that like the movie, The Horse Whisperer, mm -hmm. it reached a huge audience, but I just think it fell so short of what was actually in all of that stuff that Tom Dorrance and Ray Hunt were trying to help people get it, understand. And, um, So I think maybe if a few more voices like me and other people that understand this to a deeper degree, maybe we can explain it better or and again, not explain it better because the whole purpose of it is so that you can figure it out yourself because it'll never be the same situation mm -hmm. <laughs> turn again, you know, so you have to meet each situation with with its own circumstances or its own um, techniques. And well, and as, as you're like, the, as you're talking there, like, uh, like a little thing went off in my brain about like, you know, we're talking about the relevance of, of Shakespeare and, and the horses and the horse world, I mean, really aren't relevant to a lot of people but there is so much to be learned through examining it and understanding it and sort of in the same way like if we if we can examine it authentically if we if we don't examine it authentically we're going to lose that that connection yeah i think um that makes a little thing go off in my brain too um i think at least for me it seems like um, people out there are really hungry for what I think the cowboy world or the horsemanship world has to offer. But if they don't understand the depth of it, they're never gonna get there it's going to constantly disappoint them. Um, it's not about clothes or fashion or, you know, big wild rags or big old mustaches and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's not about six shooters and being a hero. Um, I, I can't put into words. I, I mean, I try every time I write a book, I try to put it into more words, <laughs> but they're always inadequate. I'm just hoping that the accumulation will help get a little bit more across. I mean, I, I think I've used the um, metaphor of a broken mirror before where, you know, it's this shattered mirror that's all over and 
we all find little bitty pieces of it, but we can't really quite get it to, to gel. And we probably never will get it to gel, but I think the more that we chase rabbits or phoniness or the stuff that doesn't matter, the less likely we are to ever get any satisfaction out of the little pieces that we find. So, um, so I think the reason people are interested in nonfiction or reality TV or, you know, that kind of stuff is that they're hungry for the real and they're hungry for the truth or, I mean, I know there's no such thing as truth, but they want honest conversations. They want honest friendships. They want honest marriages and relationships. And how do you get that? You know, it uh, seems to be a mystery. Oh, that was, that was big. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, you have a way of pulling stuff out of me. <laughs> wow, that was good. Um, Okay, that one sort of just, uh, uh, is there any question that I didn't ask you that we, that we should visit about, about, about the book? Um, I think we covered it more than I did in the book, so. <laughs> oh. Well, one thing I would like to mention is that there's a really nice um, tribute on the back from the editor of Eclectic Horseman magazine, Emily Kitchen. That I really liked. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity. I was very, very proud to be able to to be a part of it in a small way. Well, thank you. And well, thank you for this interview. You do a really good job. Huh. Your well, magazine is doing a good job. So keep it up. All right. I will. Well, thank you very much. And we'll uh, let folks know where they can order the book and look forward to visiting with you again in the future. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right, Barney, have a great rest of your day. Okay, you too.